Much of the country remains in the grip of a severe weather event that's brought heavy snow, high winds and blizzard conditions. With warnings of high tides in coastal areas, this weather event is not over yet. Sweden has called for international help to fight more than 40 wildfires that have broken out across the country. Temperatures have been on a par with the hottest location on Earth, Death Valley in California. The grim reality of climate change grabbed the headlines in 2018. Troops have been deployed to coastal areas in the Republic in what's expected to be the most severe storm to hit Ireland in half a century. Weather events had major impacts across the country and around the world. Conditions continuing to deteriorate. Climate change isn't just something to worry about in the coming decades. It's already here. A 2018 landmark report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change paints a far more dire picture of what's to come. Climate change is occurring earlier and more rapidly than expected. The IPCC report gives us just 12 years to make substantial reductions in emissions to limit climate change catastrophe. So this is what the report is coming up with, 2030. CO2 emissions, got to get them down by almost half. That is a, a tall order. That is going to be very difficult. And by 2050, we have to get them to 100%, basically carbon neutral. The countdown has begun. It will require huge transitions in all sorts of systems, energy, land, transportation. But what the report has done is to send out a clear message to the governments that it is physically possible. It's now up to them to decide whether they want to take up the challenge. Governments around the world are urged to act fast to drastically reduce carbon emissions. If we don't take action, the collapse of our civilizations and the extinction of much of the natural world is on the horizon. But with the severest warnings yet of impending environmental disaster, our political representatives seem indifferent to the calls for urgent action. What is undeniable is that we are very much off track in terms of meeting uh, our emissions targets for 2020 and indeed for 2030. With so much at stake, I want to explore where the ambition is going to come from to get our country back on track to a carbon-free future. Ireland is the worst performing nation in Europe on climate action, according to the latest performance index. As far as I'm concerned, uh, we are a laggard. Uh, I'm not proud of Ireland's performance on climate change. The reality is that serious government action is needed. But where is the ambition going to come from? There's a long road ahead of us, so we must lead by example, because sometimes the adults can be dumb. <laughs> to my surprise, the ambition already exists in the form of 13 recommendations put forward by the citizens of Ireland. Back in 2016, the then government established a citizens' assembly to tease out a number of difficult social and political issues. Comprising 99 randomly selected ordinary citizens from across the country, the assembly convened over 18 months and considered five subjects, including the Eighth Amendment, as well as how Ireland could become a leader in tackling climate change. The Citizens' Assembly is an exercise in deliberative democracy. It allows the citizens to have a say in uh, what our government might do, either constitutionally or policy-wise. I caught up with some of the members of the Assembly to find out what the experience was like for them. Before the Citizens' Assembly, how did you feel about climate change? I'm a stay-at-home mum and a foster mum, so my days are full with kids. I wouldn't have given it any thought, if I'm honest. I had actually just had a baby in around the time that we did uh, climate change on the Assembly. In that mindset of what the world is going to be like for her, it really, the baby plus the Citizens' Assembly was a real turning point for me. I approached the climate change issue in the same way I would have approached all the other ones. I sat down and said, here I am, I'm ignorant, educate me, and I'll try and give you an informed opinion at the end. Mairead, before the Citizens' Assembly, did you know much about climate change? I know it was first called global warming, 
and everyone sort of laughed and said, sure, it would be grand if we were really hot, you know, lovely hot summers. But we didn't think of what was really going to happen. Claire, tell me a bit about then how it worked on the day. Experts would come in and they would present to us. Then we would break off into little groups and discuss the, the information that we'd just been given. What we'd been presented with by the expert was really, experts were cold, hard facts. Cathy, what has changed for you in terms of your opinion on climate change from, from before and after the Assembly? Like, I'm from the country. I can't understand why there's an issue cutting tariff and burning it. But I didn't realise that peat is a carbon sink, takes carbon out of the atmosphere. And then we cut it and dry it and burn it and release it all back up again. And it's higher in carbon than coal even. So I would have thought it was a natural resource, you know, very eco-friendly, which it isn't. But if you don't understand the reasons why it's an issue, it's not an issue for you. I was very naive and ignorant about what was happening within the country. Uh, what our politicians were doing, what we should be doing or what we weren't doing. And uh, unfortunately we found out an awful lot about what we weren't doing rather than what we should, you know, we should have been doing over the last 10 years. They give out about Trump here. He was honest and came out of the Paris uh, Accord. Our lot play lip service, they're hypocrites. And I am terrified, I really feel it, something has to be done. After careful deliberation, the Assembly published a number of recommendations that would put planning for climate mitigation and adaptation at the heart of government policy. These included support for higher taxes on carbon-intensive activities and increased spending on public transport. As of yet, however, government has adopted none of the recommendations. If they're asking us to give them recommendations on how to be leaders, they need to rise to this challenge and to accept it. And that was a perfect, it was a perfect opportunity for them to do something and they just, they just didn't take it. It's not going to happen on the scale that it needs to happen unless the government display a really proactive, serious intent, uh, political will to, 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 to get things done and to do it very quickly. I mean, it is a catastrophe waiting to happen and people think, oh, come on, this is very extreme, I'm sure. You know, you're just a nutcase. It, it is true. Look around you, look at the facts. You know, I got a letter this week from my insurance company saying that my, they've decided my area might flood. So there's a €2,000 excess on my house insurance policy because of it. Like, that's all down to climate change, and we don't realise it. It's obvious that the Assembly has had a profound impact on Cathy, Mike, Mairead and Claire. But what was it that put ordinary citizens so far ahead of our politicians when it comes to confronting the difficult issue of climate change? Well, to find out, I'm going to track down some of the experts myself. First up is Cork, to meet energy expert Dr Paul Dean, to find out about the emissions pathway we're currently on. Paul, do you want to tell me a little bit about the graph and what it actually means? Yeah, so this graph tells the story of all the greenhouse gas emissions in a number of EU countries on a per person basis. And it tells that story from the year 1990 all the way up to today and all the way up to the year 2050. Our greenhouse gas emissions on a per person basis are actually quite large in comparison to other member states. Our emissions rise during the Celtic Tiger era up to the year 2000 where we peak emissions. Then we start to enforce some really useful policies in terms of renewable electricity and more energy efficiency. Then we come into the recession. Look at the really dramatic drop in emissions, the stuff that we buy, the stuff that we build, the stuff that we consume, that reduced quite significantly. And you can see then in 2010, which I think is probably the most striking, while every other country, the EU-wide, the UK, Sweden, they continue to go down, they are downtrending. Ireland doesn't. Ireland starts to level out and increase its yeah. carbon emissions. And that's a real big challenge for Ireland. As Ireland bounced back out of the recession, our emissions started to bounce back up as well. And that's really one of the fundamental challenges for Ireland is on linking that, 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 that link between economic activity and our emissions profile. And that's a real worrying trend for policymakers today because that trend has continued. But Paul, there was economic recovery in pretty much all of these countries, especially the UK. We know there was huge economic recovery in and around you know, 2010 onwards, but they didn't go back up. Why did they not go back up and we did? During Ireland's economic growth, we made a lot of poor policy decisions as well, particularly around land use, around planning, and particularly around the housing stock that we built. A lot of the countries in Europe, such as Sweden and the UK here, for example, they really invested heavily in public transport and public infrastructure. And that is something that unfortunately we did not succeed in doing in Ireland. Paul, the IPCC have said that 
in 12 years time, we need to have reduced our emissions by 50%. Are we on the right path to meet that? No. Looking to the future, we can look at our forecasts and the forecasts show us where we are expected to go and also where we need to go. And from the year 2035, if we continue on our current trajectory, we really need to have really disruptive and abrupt change from the year 2035. Waiting is a really poor choice. And you could even argue that waiting is actually not a choice. We're not really sure whether this is actually technically feasible at the moment, but what we do know is that certainly the red line is where we want to be. It's a lot more gentler of a transition. It's a lot more cost effective and it's a lot less disruptive in terms of our normal everyday lives. Government policies to promote intensification of beef and dairy farming, to prioritise road construction over sustainable transport options, and to continue burning peat and coal for energy, are leading the country in the wrong direction. With the mounting risks, costs and dangers associated with delayed actions, how are we to get back on the right path? Ireland faces fines of more than 450 million euro by 2020 for failing to meet legally binding targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The UK are streets ahead of us when it comes to reducing emissions. In fact, Scotland hit its 2020 emission targets five years early. I'm here to ask Professor Andy Kerr what's behind Scotland's success. Andy, Ireland is going to fail miserably in terms of meeting their 2020 targets. How is Scotland doing in this regard? The Scottish Government realised that actually there were both economic opportunities to delivering renewable energy as well as environmental benefits. So they started pushing very hard for promoting renewables within Scotland and set increasingly high targets. We used UK subsidies that existed at the time and essentially made it a very safe, easy place for companies to invest in Scotland to deliver renewable electricity generation. Scotland has made considerable progress in switching to clean energy. In 2016, the country's last remaining coal-fired power plant was closed. In 2017, electricity consumption from green sources was on average 70% and they're on track to produce all of their electricity from renewables by 2020. So why is Scotland so successful at harnessing its natural resources to create green energy? We created a Climate Change Act which set very uh, powerful targets and in some ways there was a little bit of we want to do better than the UK so whatever the UK was setting we want to do a little more than that to try and prove that Scotland was better at delivering climate change action than the rest of the UK. Andy it sounds like there's a bit of healthy rivalry between maybe Scotland and the, the rest of the UK but how is the government held accountable for their plan? What they did was set up an independent body, the Committee on Climate Change, and the Independent Committee on Climate Change has been a very powerful voice for explaining what could be achieved and what isn't being achieved, and that's been hugely helpful. So a change in government in Scotland doesn't mean that there's going to be cuts in the climate change plan, there's a long-term plan laid out. Yes, that's right, and, and they've set out a long-term plan, they've developed a long-term energy strategy, they've, de they've developed a very long-term climate plan, which is very much focused on delivery now, and delivery of things like warm, affordable homes, of improving transport systems and so on. So we're not trying to do it just to save the climate, you're trying to make a better place to live. And that's the thing that often has resonance with people uh, in different communities across the country. Andy, there's this idea that it's going to be costly to the economy to become more green and more climate friendly. Is that the case in Scotland? If you look at the growth of business sectors, the green business sector is actually growing much faster than other business sectors across Scotland and across the UK. So we are actually getting a lot of jobs coming into that sector and it's a thriving sector with a global market. Scotland's green sector is undeniably growing and they've emerged as a global leader in wind power. It's home to the world's first floating wind farm. And last year, the world's most powerful wind turbine began rotating off the coast of Aberdeen. Their transition to an environmentally sustainable future is not just driving down emissions, 
but it's also breathing new life and creating economic benefits across the country. I've come to Campbelltown on the Mull of Kintyre to see what this actually means for rural communities. In the late 90s in Campbelltown, we had a, a shipyard and a clothing factory, and they both closed down round about the same time within a very short space of time, which is pretty devastating for such a small community. We had one of the highest unemployment rates in Scotland. The school rules were dropping. There really was down on its luck kind of feel about the town. Since then, there's been a number of uh, companies who've also come to this area or who have developed in this area on the back of the renewables industries. We estimate that for every one job here in the factory, there's another two in the, in the, in the wider supply chain area that are, that are either directly or indirectly benefiting from, from this facility. The wind turbine towers built here supply Scotland's large and growing wind energy sector, and they're also shipped to Europe and beyond. We can send them pretty much anywhere you like. <laughs> um, we're, we're very close to Ireland here, just across the water on a clear day we can, we can wave. Leslie, how does it make you feel that you're working in a green industry? I think the fact that it's a green industry is a, is a bonus, um, but it's also the fact that it's jobs, it's skilled jobs, it's an industry that attracts opportunities, um, especially for rural communities like, like Campbelltown. I didn't leave school thinking I would ever work for a wind turbine company, but, but here I am and I really enjoy it. It's a very dynamic industry. Do you think it's a flash in the pan or do you think that these are sustainable jobs? Is there a future? Well, when the factory first opened, um, a lot of people thought it wouldn't last and they gave us five years and we're now 18 years in, so I'm hoping that it'll continue in that way. Scotland's success in reducing its CO2 emissions fills me with a sense of optimism. It demonstrates that with enough ambition, political leadership and buy-in from businesses and citizens, it's possible to decouple carbon emissions from our economy. So if Scotland can do this, why can't we? I asked Professor John Fitzgerald from the Climate Change Advisory Council, where do we start? How do we fix it? How do we go towards a carbon-free future? Well, the first thing is to get the price right. And people don't, they say, oh, typical economist, we need a carbon tax. And I was very disappointed in the budget that the carbon tax wasn't raised. But the reaction to it, there were probably more people saying it was a bad idea not to raise it than people welcoming the fact that it wasn't raised. For the people of Ireland to adopt the technologies we need, they have to be the cheap solution. And for that to happen, the price has got to go up. The price reflects the damage done to the environment and that, in particular, the carbon price. So having getting a carbon tax right is essential, but it is only the beginning. The idea of a carbon tax means that the government sets a price that must be paid for every tonne of greenhouse gas that's emitted. The goal is to change behaviour. Businesses and consumers will take steps, like switching to electric cars or adopting new, more energy efficient technologies to reduce their emissions. 80% of the members agreed that they would pay higher taxes to tackle climate change. To get 80% of anyone to agree to pay more tax, I think, is astounding. You know, and when people understood the seriousness of the issue, they were happy to say, yeah, I would actually pay a bit extra. If we have to pay money in order to sort out the future of the country, then why not? We had to pay through our noses to sort out the financial crisis. To actually save the planet, I don't think it's, it's going to kill us to actually spend some money. I'd, I'd be honest, I think the government don't really handle tax that well as they are. So, Given them more money, you'd, you'd wonder, is it going to make it any more efficient? But you could only hope. Handled correctly, the carbon tax could help transform our society. But convincing a sceptical electorate to pay more tax will be a challenge. So we've had a lot of problems with taxes in Ireland in the past and around the EU. I mean, we've had huge issue with water taxes. We know in France they're rioting about increases in petrol costs. I'm just wondering, how, in practical terms, you make this palatable? How do you show people and get them to buy in? Politicians need help to solve this problem because people don't like paying taxes. There's a huge amount about this issue that's about how it's sold. If it's sold the way an economist would sell it, oh, well, everybody needs to pay for the pollution that they're causing. And if we pay, we'll use less. That's not going to win any hearts. If you say, we're going to raise the price of fossil fuels, but we're going to give everybody a carbon dividend to help them manage that. So you could talk about a fee and a carbon dividend. 
So they're going to be paying more for their heating bills, they're going to be paying more for their transport costs, and to compensate, you give people a cheque. And if you were to increase the carbon tax by €50 Euro a tonne, you could give every household in the country a cheque of €500 Euro a year. And it's a carbon dividend. This is your dividend because you're paying more for fossil fuels. We need to reassure people that this is not going into the government exchequer. This is going into their pockets. It sounds a little bit too good to be true in Ireland. I'm a bit kind of dubious about that, that it just arrives in the account. Yeah, and this is, this is the biggest resistance we have to this idea. People think it's too good to be true, but they're doing it in British Columbia. They're doing it in Switzerland. Why not? So that's one way you can win citizen support and raise revenue. The second way is by using some of the revenue to invest in green technologies, to invest, for example, in a, a fund to help some of the negatively affected communities in the Midlands, in the peat sector, for example, or that could be used to support people to retrofit their homes. Where's the resistance to this? Why isn't it happening? There is huge resistance to ring-fencing revenue for one particular purpose. They don't like it. They don't like ring fencing. There's a fancy word for it. It's called hypothecation. They don't like hypothecation because it creates too little flexibility to use revenue however government wants it. So if you, if you hypothecated every tax, it would make no sense. It does have to be an exception, but this is an exceptional circumstance. No TD will take the bull by the horns and go with raising carbon taxes because they're looking over their shoulder for their next vote. So how do we get political buy-in? If you look at the manifestos at the last election, many of them, there was no mention of climate change. They didn't see the people of Ireland being worried about climate change. It is only if the people of Ireland worry about climate change that our politicians can deliver. Like, talking to quite a number of them, they actually take this very seriously. But their concern is, you go out and say, um, we're going to have to make changes now. The people who are going to benefit most will be our great-grandchildren who are not yet born. That is a completely different issue for politicians. And it's why, to some extent, it's an ethical issue. The reason we do it is because it's the right thing to do, but politicians aren't used to go out there. They kind of expect it's priests or rabbis who will go out and say, this is the ethical. For politicians to go out to the electorate and say, this is the right thing to do, very difficult for politicians. What can we do as ordinary citizens to help push the issue of climate change? First of all, saying to your politicians, whenever you meet them, you think it's serious and why aren't you doing something about it? That reassures politicians that actually it's an issue that people of Ireland take seriously. Until now, they haven't really done so, and you can see it from the party manifestos. And unless the people of Ireland want it, it's not going to happen. So how do we get the people of Ireland to demand climate action? I think it's hard to get people to listen because it's perceived as a boring topic. And, you know, you'd be counted as a tree hugger if you're banging on about climate change all the time. But it's, you know, when you do understand it, it's, it's so different. Look at the hurricanes and the tornadoes that we've had so far this year. Look at our own weather that we've had. Look at the drought in the summer and the awful spring and bad winter we had last year. So it is happening. And I think everyone has to be to be prepared to do something. Reveal happened because conversations were suddenly being had out of nowhere. You know, the people spoke about their experiences. That could happen with climate change, but it will be a case of being willing to educate ourselves, being willing to talk about it, and really taking responsibility for it.